over at bangthebook.com. We are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. I've written up about 20 bowl game previews here so far, working through the rest of them as this week goes along. So you check all those out over at the website. Still covering the NFL, still covering college basketball, the NHL, and the NBA. We'll have a UFC preview for you for this weekend as well. A lot of stuff going on over at the website. Make sure you head on over there and check it all out. Check out our Bang the Book YouTube page as well. Four free pick videos from Brian Blessing. I'll be doing some stuff here this afternoon for the bowl games. So you can check that out on our YouTube page. And finally, of course, as you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio, presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook. BTB, the number 200, is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook. 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino. At BetDSI, it's only a game until you bet it. A couple of guests on the program here today, and we start with professional handicapper Brian Leonard from wagertalk.com. Brian, how's it going today, man? Hey, everything's going great. Uh, it's a big time of uh, sports betting with basketball going on, conference action getting ready to start in uh, in college basketball. NBA is uh, in fine tune right now, and obviously we've got the bowl games. Uh, NFL has been a little bit weird on uh, – it's been a weird season overall in the NFL – a lot of guys and a lot of sports books and people that I talk to are struggling in the NFL this year. Um, a lot of weird stuff going on in the NFL, but uh, yeah, a lot of things, the more things we got to bet on, the better chances we got to win. So uh, yeah, it's a good time of year for me. Yeah, most definitely. A lot of stuff going on here. And in fact, I was just looking at uh, the revenue figures for New Jersey and Pennsylvania and you know the months in November that they had with all the sports going on. Absolute insanity. Same thing out there in Nevada. So a lot of opportunities means a lot of ways to get an edge over the sports books. And hopefully you've been able to do that here throughout November and December. And hopefully we can carry that on through the bowl season as well. But Brian, we take a look in the NBA real quickly here. Well, it looks like a nine game card tonight. So a lot of games going on next week. Of course, we've got the five games on the Christmas holiday, all staggered, all spread out. Some of these teams accustomed to playing on the holiday. Some of these teams not. With the fact that it's Christmas, the fact that you know these players are away from their families, and also you may have some subdued crowds because people are doing their holiday things with their families. Do you handicap the Christmas games any different than you would any other day of the season? Yeah, you got to take any information that you can uh, on these games. I was just down on the strip yesterday, and or a couple of days what? ago, you went to the strip. Yeah, I went down to the strip. Um, there was a shindig down there. Kelly and Vegas does some things with. Uh, Bleacher Report, and they had a nice uh, get-together down at Caesars the other day. So the wife and I and, and Marco D'Angelo went down and had a good time. Uh, heads off to Bleacher Report. Uh, really nice get-together on that day and got some free drinks and some free food. So, hey, can't turn that down. But uh, there, there's not as many people on the strip that people got things going on right now. I went to a local casino last night, and it was slow. So... People are less inclined to uh, go to sporting events now, and that's one of the things, you know, I put out some college basketball yesterday. That's one of the things I pointed out, that you've got these teams, you know, well, I went against I went against uh, Marquette yesterday, and you got these teams come the holiday season. They're laying 25, 30 points, and, you know, the fans are gone. The kids are going back to vis- visit family. So your home court values in college basketball this time of year are lessened. So it's something to keep, keep in mind in, but uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a totally different time to, uh, to handicap. And, and you're right. It's, you know, we just assume that athletes have got, uh, you know, everything planned around, you know, what's going on, but they're people too. And, you know, LeBron James, we're both from Cleveland. LeBron James has said for years that he enjoys getting together with the teams and playing on it because it's good for his employer. And, you know, and a lot of people like to watch those games, but he says, as a player, you hate being away from family and LeBron's always been big in family. And I know a lot of these guys are, so uh, it's going to be interesting because you mentioned there's teams that are used to playing every year. Well, what do you do if you're a Golden State Warriors hosting Houston that day? Golden State's a team that uh, is not the same as it's been in the past. Uh, will they be excited to be able to showcase themselves in a season that they've been really bad? Or will this be a situation where they don't even want to be there? And it's, it's very similar to the Pelicans when they travel to uh, the, the Denver, too. This is a team that uh, lost their star player and they're not nearly as good. So uh, the NBA, when they scheduled these games, they were taking what they thought were going to be the best teams. And it 
didn't seem to work out that way for a couple of them. No, it hasn't. And, you know, you look at a team like New Orleans, for example, I'm, I'm looking this up here on the fly. The last time they played a Christmas game was 2015. So, again, not a team that's really accustomed to playing in that type of role. Denver hasn't played one since 2012, so it's been a while for them, too. You know, you get these teams – you know, LeBron's used to doing it, so LeBron's team's going to be fine. Boston does it every year. Toronto does it every year. You know, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, those teams kind of becoming fixtures here now that they've gotten a little bit better. But for some of these teams, it is a little bit different to go and play on that Christmas holiday. And something else that's always interesting, too, is, you know, we've kind of had this discussion before on the show, and some people have different opinions about it, but some people will say, hey, the home team does better for the holidays because they're able to be at home. They are able to see their families in some capacity. Other people say, no, it's the road team because they know that they're going to be away from home. They're not planning family get-togethers around games, stuff like that. They're just with the team in the hotel or in bars or restaurants, you know, wherever. Where do you kind of fall on that spectrum? Yeah, I, I agree with the road team having the advantage here because you already know you're gone, you're away from your family. Uh, in many cases, they've celebrated the holidays before they go or they're going to do it when they get back. Um, whereas the home team, they still have to get their, you know, they, they've got everything going on with the families. And it's more of a distraction uh, because they are there um, just to have to get away and, and, and play the ball game. I think it's a, a disadvantage for uh, for the home team. And, you know, we've got, we do have three games on, on the, the uh, Christmas card, Boston, Toronto, Milwaukee, Philadelphia, Lakers, Clippers, where actuality, these players are going to be going full bore in these games because those are big rivalries and you're playing for bragging rights and playoff position. So um, those are the games that I, I would think would play more to the script as opposed to the games where you've got the Pelicans and the Warriors where uh, you you have to question some motivation there if they want to play or even if the other team takes them for granted. So uh, it'll, it, it's, it's always nice to watch these games on Christmas. I, I don't have any kids. Uh, I don't believe you have any kids that you know of. So it's always uh, something that I end up doing is watching the NBA on Christmas Day. That's very true. If there are any out there, I certainly don't know about them. But uh, you know, something I think is interesting here, and this will be the last point we make on the NBA, is that it kind of used to be one of those scenarios where people would say, well, the season starts on Christmas Day. Right. You know, that's when the teams start to take it seriously, start to really come together and play well. But as you look up and down the standings here, the good teams have been good pretty much from the jump. So I think that's kind of an interesting thing to consider here is maybe the dog days of winter do kind of slow these teams down a little bit. Whereas in the past, it would be, okay, it's Christmas. It's time to get going now. Seems like some of these teams are kind of going full bore right from the jump. Yeah, they are. And one of the teams that's really surprised me about that is Milwaukee. I thought last year when they came out and just dominated everybody all season long, that that would be a team that, you know, because they ended up losing in the playoffs, I thought coming into this season, I go, okay, they're going to do it similar to like a lot of the other teams do, where, you know, instead of trying to win 70, 70 basketball games, you try to just put yourself in a position where you're going to be healthy come playoff time. But Milwaukee hasn't done that. And, uh, you know, we're catching Milwaukee the next time out. They're going to be uh, uh, coming off of a loss. And Milwaukee's been one of those teams that just dominated off a loss lately. So uh, I think they play the Lakers, and the Lakers are coming off a loss. So that should be a pretty good game coming up the uh, next couple of days here. Yeah, it definitely should be. That. Milwaukee was, what, 18, 19 in a row, something like that, before they lost that last time out. And, you know, the Lakers surprised me, too, because – I mean, LeBron seemed to coast at times through the regular season last year, and maybe he's making up for it this year. 24-4 and four already uh, for the Lakers. They seem like they have no interest in slowing down anytime soon. But we will talk some more NBA, obviously, once we get through the holidays here, once college football's over. We'll be talking a lot more NBA in the segments with Brian. But celebrations of a different kind here, Brian. These teams playing the early bowl games, you know, celebrating – winning six or seven games, making it to the postseason, in some cases going to some sort of a destination. And the first game, definitely a destination bowl here between Buffalo and Charlotte. We'll get to that in a second. I don't remember if we talked about this two weeks ago when you were last on the show, but what is your process like for the bowl season here? I mean, have you taken some positions already? Do you kind of wait for things to kind of sort themselves out? How do you uh, handicap the bowl season here? Yeah, I don't do a lot of betting ahead of time. Um, 
I've noticed that, uh, at least in my account, uh, when I put up a, a bet early, it doesn't seem to do quite as well. Uh, I like to see how the teams are treated. And, you know, we've got a game on today's card or, or on this weekend's card uh, where you've got Kent State and uh, Utah State, where Utah State has some suspensions. Um, it's I would hate to bet on a team and all of a sudden they suspend your quarterback or some of your better players. And that's always a concern about putting the putting the uh, plays out early is you don't know that information. I like to get as much information as possible. And a lot of it comes down to reading when the teams get into that city, what they're doing. Um, you know, in Las Vegas, you got the Las Vegas ball. So we we're able to follow that pretty well. And, you know, there's enough people out here that are in the casino all the time. And that's one of the advantages of being out here in Las Vegas is sometimes, in fact, a lot of times, you will see teams, in the, more, more in the professional sports, obviously, because they're older than college, but you'll hear stories. You know, it used to be the, you know, we've talked about this in the past, where the Portland Trailblazers would come to town, and they'd stop here before they would go off to play L.A. or something, and they would always be at the casinos all day. So people were able to say, hey, Portland's in town, and they were at the casinos till 2 a.m. in the morning. Well, you could use that to your advantage. When teams are out on the road for these bowl games, you can read the local papers and see what, what they're doing. And I, I've known for, for myself uh, a few times where I've had press passes. If you're down on the field with these teams when you're practicing, that's a huge advantage. You can see who's going through the motions and who's, who's playing it to win. So there's a lot of good information out there you get the few days before the game. And that's something you take away when you're playing early. And normally playing early, is the way most of the professionals do. I don't know if they do that as much in the bowl season as they would in the regular season. Well, and as we look at uh, this one here, Buffalo and Charlotte again in the Bahamas Bowl destination game. Uh, Buffalo, you know, this is not a program that goes to a lot of bowl games. Charlotte, you know, that's a team that just transitioned from FBS or from FCS to FBS not that long ago. First year for head coach Will Healy. Lance Leopold's been there for a while uh, with this Buffalo Bulls team. This has had some interesting line movement because you know as well as I do, both of us in MAC country, um, well, at least you used to be, the MAC is not good in bowl games. But we've seen Buffalo go up from minus four and a half to minus six and a half here, and then a massive move down on the total from 57 to as low as 51. Very heavy wins expected in Nassau for this game, that driving the line move down and probably adding some fuel to the Buffalo side here since Charlotte. It's a little bit more of a multi multi dimensional offense. Yeah, I think it's the Buffalo defense. You know, obviously they're playing max schedule, but they only allow two point nine yards a carry, and uh, you know the 49ers average five point two yards a carry. So, if you take it a multi dimensional offense and you're uh, cutting down on one of their main ingredients, that's a concern, especially when you take a look at this. Uh, the Char the Charlotte passing game, the last two games coming out of the season, 166 uh, passing yards against Marshall, 166 passing yards against Old Dominion. So uh, they're not coming in this um, really strong in the passing side. Um, you know, Chris Reynolds got a decent uh, decent pass rating on 155, but uh, that's a concern if you're playing if you're playing Charlotte and they're uh, and they can't run the football. That is something to worry about, but. I come into these, I think a lot of people do, but maybe I, I, I look at it and I see how the uh, these conferences have done over the years. And the MAC has been bad. The only one that's been worse, is, I think, lately has been the Pac-12. It's been terrible in these con in these uh, non-conference games going into the bowl season here. So uh, I see why Buffalo took some money there. Um, I, I would agree off of what it was originally. But uh, now you're catching close to seven, six and a half, sometimes a little bit juice, depending on where you go. Uh, if it's less than seven, I kind of lean here with Buffalo, but it's not something that I'm going to play myself because, you know, you, you get it you, when you're picking marbles out of 100 marbles and 72 of them or whatever are black, and that's the losses out of the Mac, uh, you're probably better off just passing on those games unless you're going to play the opposition. Something I think is really interesting about this game is that Buffalo was 12th nationally in total rushing yards this season, but 91st in yards per play. So again, this is a team that does run the football effectively, cannot throw it at all whatsoever. 
the weather conditions certainly going to help them in that regard where they're not going to have to throw the football. But what they like to do is they like to kind of lean on teams. They like to be very physical with teams, kind of weigh them down until in the second half, they can just sort of have their way in the running game. Buffalo 0-3 in bowl games, so they're certainly highly motivated to get their first bowl win. Uh, Charlotte here, you know, I kind of like Charlotte if I get seven with reasonable juice, just because, again, the expectation here, a lot of running the football, a low-scoring game. If Charlotte can stay on the field a little bit, sustain some drives, they can hang around here. If they can't, this one probably gets ugly. And then at that point, what I do is I take like a Buffalo second-half position, something like that, if they're just going to, you know, really wear Charlotte down. So that's an important thing here too, is that you don't have to play these full games. You can look and see how this game is playing out, look and see how well-prepared both teams are, then make some sort of live or second-half position. Yeah, you definitely can. I do want to point out uh, how well the underdogs do straight up too. So if you're looking at underdogs, make sure you sprinkle a little bit on the money line because uh, these teams that went outright – in the bowls, most of the time they're uh, they're uh, winning the game straight up and covering the spread. So when you got a nice underdog, this is the one I don't do a lot with money line underdogs unless I'm it's less than three points normally. But uh, in the bowl season, I make sure if there's an underdog I like, I put a little bit on the money line. So as we take a look here at the Frisco Bowl, this one between Kent State and Utah State, I wrote my preview up over at BangTheBook.com nine days ago. And when we talk about college football bowl games, a lot can change in nine days. And a lot has changed with this Frisco Bowl down in Texas. Again, Kent State and Utah State. Kent State was taking some early money anyway down into the plus seven range. Then it comes out yesterday, Utah State, three players arrested for misdemeanor marijuana possession. One of them, quarterback Jordan Love, playing his final college game, going to the NFL draft, which he announced Uh, long before this game is going to be played. Now we're in a holding pattern. This line's gone down to six and a half, but we don't know if Jordan Love is officially suspended for the bowl game yet as the university is still investigating what actually happened. So what do you do with this game at this point in time? Yeah, it's it's just something that you've got incomplete information on and you hate to, uh, to invest in that unless you get the information first, which at this time with the game coming up on a, just a few days, you know, I believe it's uh, tomorrow, I believe, or two days from now. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a situation where, you know, Kent State's only had one bowl game. I, my, my records go back 20 years. Uh, they had a bowl game in 2012, the GoDaddy Bowl, and uh, they lost that game. So they haven't won a bowl game in at least 20 years. Uh, the motivation is there for Kent State. I mean, obviously, you've got a second-year coach in Sean Lewis, and they won two games last year. So they're excited to be at this ball game, Utah State. I didn't understand the coaching hire in the first place over there. You've got a, a NFL caliber quarterback and uh, Gary Anderson doesn't let him throw the football. Um, but on the other hand, I do like teams in ball season that suspend players. A lot of people will look at that. I feel it totally different than uh, something in, in the regular season, but I like to have teams that the coaches come down and uh they pull in the reins on all these kids because a lot of them treat it like a vacation. And uh, if they start suspending some players, then all of a sudden it gets the team's attention. So I like to take advantage of that. Uh, but the problem we have here is the quarterback. And if the quarterback's not there, you, Utah State's not one of these teams that gets quarterbacks that gets drafted to the NFL. So if he's not going to play, I want no part of Utah State. I just, man, I the bowl game aside, you know, I mean – it, it, it shouldn't be a thing. You know, marijuana, it, it is what it is. I mean, it's, it's something people use to relax or for a variety of other reasons, have some fun, whatever. Shouldn't be the big deal that it is. But, man, if you're trying to improve your NFL draft stock, like, this is the last thing you want to do. And, right. and, again, I mean, the NFL is not – they don't care too much about marijuana. But if you don't play in this bowl game and you've already you – know, you're already coming from the Mountain West where you don't play against good defenses anyway – that's a tough thing. And, and to me, it makes me kind of wonder what this Utah State mindset is now. Because now they don't have the guy that can move them up and down the field. At least they probably won't. We don't know that for sure. I can't believe we don't know that for sure at this point in time. But now I wonder about Utah State. And I wondered about Utah State coming into this game anyway. And furthermore, this line was already moving on Kent before all this news broke. And we just talked about it. 
the Mac sucks in bowl games, but people like the golden flashes in this one. So I, and this is going to be a, a complete and utter stay away for me. My condolences to anybody that already played the over in this game. Although with the total going up a little bit, maybe suggest that some people are getting some kind of positive report on Jordan Love being able to play and maybe kind of make amends for this uh, you know, alleged transgression. I, I don't know, but that's the hard part about locking in plays early in the bowl season, man. You don't know what could happen. Yeah, that's for sure. And especially when we know that these early bowl games tend to go over. Uh, I think a lot of people just got out, and as soon as the lines come out, you you pick your spots and try to try to bet an over situation, and then uh, all of a sudden the quarterback gets gets suspended, and that's really hurt your over. But you know we'll have to see how it works out. But uh, yeah, a lot of, a lot of people are do things different in the bowl season than what they do for regular season, and you try to set yourself up for middles. Uh, the, the, these lines in the bowls they they tend to move a lot because you got such a long time between the games and got a lot more information. Uh, so a lot of people are put in blind bets early on, um, comes to hurt them in certain situations or help them in others. So that's just part of the gambling situation. All right. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this one. I've actually got a side bet with our friend Brad Powers on this game since we're on opposite sides. Game 207-208, Central Michigan, San Diego State, the New Mexico Bowl down in Albuquerque. Central Michigan was plus four and a half at the open. They are now down to three and a half. Very low total on this game for a bowl game in the 40 and a half range. What do you think about this one, Brian? Well, the problem you have with San Diego State is uh, Rocky Long's never paid much attention to trying to win these bowl games. Um, So that's a concern. Normally, I I love Rocky Long. I've said it before. That's a guy who, when he gets interviewed, he tells you, he doesn't beat around the bush. He tells you what he's going to do. He tells you what he expects. So, um, you know, San Diego State's a team I like to bet on, when, it, especially like they're coming off a loss or a bad performance. Uh, he gets – I talked about uh, getting your teams ready and, and putting putting the whip down on your on your team. He's, he's one of those guys that does it. Problem is, in the bowl games, he has not performed very well. You go back and you look just the last two years. Last year, they played in the Frisco Bowl. They were shut out by Ohio. 27 to nothing. Is that some motivation where you're coming back to the same place again and you're off of a shutout loss? I don't know. The year before that, they lose to Army outright as a favorite in the Armed Forces Bowl. So um, San Diego State's a team that comes to the Bowls all the time. Plus, in fact, they've played the last nine years they've been to the Bowls. So I don't know if it's a big deal. Plus, you play in San Diego. I mean, that's that's a destination city. So Um, I don't think it means as nearly as much for San Diego State as it does for the opposition. And uh, but the problem, as we've talked about, is the Mac has been very bad here. So I've got a team I'm looking to fade from the Mac. I got a quarter, a coach who hasn't done well in bowl games. I'm looking to fade that. I don't want any part of this game, to be honest with you. I won't be on this one. All right. Fair enough. I'm taking the Mac team here. I'm taking Central Michigan. I got it plus four and a half. As I mentioned, now down to three and a half and three and a half is where the uh, the side bet is here with, between Brad and I. So getting a little bit worse of the number than I actually played. But I mean, look, you got a San Diego State team that, you know, as you said, Rocky Long doesn't seem to worry too much about the Bulls, maybe coming off of last year, a little bit more incentive. But this Central Michigan team, I mean, this is how you put an exclamation point on what's been a really good season. Last year, 3.8 yards per play on offense. This year, 6.15. I'm a little bit surprised that nobody came asking for Jim McElwain here. Maybe they want to see a second year for him there at Central Michigan. But this is how you put an exclamation point on a season where you really progressed a lot. And I think that's one of the things that maybe we should look at. I wish I had something to quantify this. But, you know, maybe it's kind of the Kent State theory at play here, too. If you were really bad the year before and you've been considerably better, you want to finish that season with a win. You want to go into the offseason being really proud of what you accomplished, not saying, yeah, we were better, but look what we did in the bowl game. It's, yeah, look what we did and look how we finished it. I think that's a really big motivating factor for teams here. I know Rolf Michaels has talked about, you know, in college basketball, teams trying to get to 20 wins or 25 wins. Obviously, in college football, trying to get to 10 wins is nice. But I think there's incentive there, too. If you were really bad the year before, you want to go to a bowl game and finish it off strong. And I think, that's the position that Central's in here. Yep, I, I agree. All right, so we take a look at one more bowl game here for Saturday, and uh, one in your backyard. I don't know if you're going to this one or not, but the Washington State or the Washington 
excuse me, Washington and Boise State game. Game 215, 216, the Las Vegas Bowl. Last game here for Chris Peterson, as we all know, taking on his former team. Washington opened three, went to three and a half, came back down to three at some places. Now it's three and a half market wide with a total of 50. Yeah, this has got some uh, extra extra sub stories as you would po- as you pointed out, and uh, you know both these teams with not only with the coaching situation, these are two teams that have had a lot of success in the past, especially Boise, uh, a team that uh, is really represented the Mountain West Conference very well over the years. Uh, Washington was a team that I bet against early in the season. I did it when I took uh, Utah plus the points against them um, in a game that. Utah dominated anyway, so uh, I played a couple of those uh, early games from the games of the years, and it worked out well. But, yeah, Washington, disappointing season overall, and uh, obviously with the with the coaching situation, um, I would think that they would have extra motivation here with, with the coach uh, the coach playing his former team and uh, see how that one works out. But, uh, yeah, this is a Washington team. They, their run defense has been pretty good. Uh, 3.8 on the season, um, and uh, Boise averages 4.5 yards per carry. Uh, one actually, Boise on uh, the run 1.0, they average more than they allow. Washington 0.4, allowing more than they allow, or excuse me, uh, producing more than they allow in the running game. But yeah, this is an interesting hand, hand, uh, handicap from, from many ways, um, and uh, I at least for my numbers, the line is. About where it should be. Um, I haven't gotten involved here, and it, it's more of a game that I'm excited to watch than bet on. Uh, but at this point, the line's pretty much where I expected it to be, and I'm not involved in it as of yet. Yeah, I mean, this is one where I know a lot of people were saying I'm playing Washington no matter what, especially with Chris Peterson's final game, and then Peterson draws Boise State, which makes it even more emotional, mm-hmm. even more difficult, and. And something I think is a little bit challenging here to me is you, know, you mentioned these early bowl games tend to be a lot of overs because you've got teams that, you know, have flaws, but they're playing these early bowl games. They want to go out there and have fun and on a high note, they're really playing free and loose for the most part in this game, you know, Boise state, those players are far enough removed from Chris Peterson that it doesn't really affect them a whole lot. It doesn't mean a whole lot to them. They're aware of what he means to the program, obviously, but There's no personal connection, really, to Chris Peterson. Washington's players, on the other hand, I think they'll be playing very tight in this game. And the more I think about it, the more I may kind of look to go on the Boise State side here in this one, especially getting the hook at three and a half. They have no extra pressure on them. Whereas Washington, they don't want Chris Peterson to go out with a loss, and in particular, to go out with a loss against the team that gave him his first head coaching job. So... Boise State can just go out there and play. Washington maybe tightens up a little bit, maybe puckers up a little bit. I think I may end up on Boise State here, even though, like you, this one's pretty much right on my number. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't fault you for that. All right, so we transition over to the – actually, you know what? Let me ask you about this real quickly here. Yeah. Oklahoma and LSU, the first semifinal game in the Peach Bowl. Are you surprised to see this thing get to 14 so early in the process? Um, there's been concerns some – for some suspensions here from Oklahoma. And that's, that's why I believe that the line's moving up a little bit. Um, if they, if there are, if Oklahoma does suspend players for the final four, I got to give that university a lot of credit. Uh, Cause I can't see a lot of teams being in that position that would take that uh, chance. But uh, it, it, it is going up to the point now where I'm starting to get some, uh, some uh, interest in the dog here, but all it all would depend on who's going to play. Um, you know, they're, they've been like an afterthought. And in fact, you know, they've been thought of an afterthought, even in the handicapping arena where, you know, my power ratings have basically the top three teams all within like two points of each other. And then you've got a huge drop off. Uh, that could be a motivating factor for Oklahoma. In fact, it should be a motivating factor for Oklahoma. But then you've got Oklahoma team who's been here before and they have not played well in these uh, games against tougher competition. Um, LSU, you know, it used to be the deal with the uh, Heisman Trophy winner. You would go against those teams. I don't believe it's done nearly as well as of late, but 
the only way I would look is Oklahoma, but it all depends on waiting until up until game time to see who's available. Yeah, I didn't notice anything about the suspensions. I'm actually looking through that now. I guess that broke over the weekend, and I was out of town. Or I guess it broke on Monday, so I was still trying to catch up on everything from the weekend. But yeah, we'll see what those suspensions wind up looking like there uh, for Oklahoma. Seems like a decent number of them on the defensive side, which obviously when you play LSU, that's uh, definitely not what you want to have to deal with. So I guess we'll see how that developing situation plays out. As we transition over to the NFL side, I want to ask you about a couple of games here, Brian. Game 473-474, Baltimore and Cleveland. Everybody knows this is a revenge spot for Baltimore coming off that Browns loss earlier on in the season. The Browns are done. They're not going to the playoffs. And it seems like the shit may be hitting the fan with Freddie Kitchens, some of the members of the team. It's not a real great scenario in Cleveland right now, but they are getting 10 at home in this one. What are you thinking, Brian? Can you take the Browns? You're going to lay it? What are you going to do here? Yeah. Yeah. This is a real tough handicap because uh, not only do you have the revenge situation, you have the Cleveland all falling apart. Now they're completely not, uh, out of the playoff picture. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, when this, this opened seven and then hit up to 10, uh, there's no way I could play Baltimore laying 10 on the road against a divisional rival second time around. Sure, Baltimore has that revenge for that uh, 40 to 25 loss. Uh, Cleveland just ran the ball right down their throat, 6.7 yards per carry. And you've got to, you know, Nick Chubb, or, uh, Nick Chubb is trying to win the uh, the rushing title for Cleveland. And that's, that's something that I haven't seen in a long time. Um, so I'm sure that's something that uh, the fans will be rooting for. But uh, Baltimore right now, I always say about the NFL, is once a team looks like they're the best team in the NFL and everybody's talking about them, being this great team, you want to fade those teams. So you're betting on a Baltimore team right now at the highest possible level. Now, the question you have to ask yourself is, will Cleveland, with the team they have, with the coaching staff that has not had a good season whatsoever here, uh, will this team, from a pride standpoint, come out and play a divisional rival? And uh, get get uh, get this either get the victory or play them tough enough to cover this number. That's the major question, and I don't know if I know the answer to that. Um, you're you're a professional player. It's, sort, it's a little bit different than it is in college, where you're playing for contracts in the NFL. There's going to be a coaching change in Cleveland. I I believe it's pretty certain. I don't know if they've announced anything as of yet. But these guys are going to be putting stuff on tape. And when the new ownership or, or, excuse me, the new management team comes in there, they're going to see if you played your hardest in a game that didn't matter. And are you the kind of guy they want on the team? So I can't see the Browns laying down against a divisional rival here. And I can't bet Baltimore because you're just playing the peak of the stock market there. Yeah, that's an excellent point. I mean, you know, this Baltimore team, and again, I mean, we thought last week, you know, maybe that's the flat spot for them. Playing the Jets on a short week, team that they could easily run over if they wanted to, and that line still goes up, and they still run over that team, and I don't even know how much they wanted to. So you are buying really, really high on Baltimore right now if you wind up taking them at this price point. So I agree with that handicap on your end, Brian. One more game I want to ask you about here as we flash forward to Monday Night Football Green Bay and Minnesota. This line, Minnesota minus four, moving right on through what used to be the dead zone up to five and a half. Five kind of comes into play now with the missed extra points and all that. But they had a lot of steam on the Minnesota side here for this one and what looks like a little bit of a sharp versus public type of game. Yeah, definitely. A uh, revenge game for Minnesota. They lose that game in week two at Green Bay, 21 to 16. Um they lost a turnover battle in that game by two. And uh, that's actually the worst. Well, they had another one that against Chicago. They lost that turnover battle by two. But that's the two uh, worst uh, performances from a turnover standpoint of the season. But keep in mind, you know, Minnesota's playing great ball. And I had Minnesota and I had Green Bay last week. So it worked out well for me. But, you know, they're coming off a game against the Chargers. They were plus six turnovers in that game. Uh, obviously a lot of that had to do with the quarterbacking for the Chargers and, and we'll deal with that, you know, later on the next uh, couple of weeks on what's going on there is I'm sure the Chargers will be taking a quarterback in the draft, but, 
Um, you know, Minnesota, in my opinion, Minnesota is about a point better here, which would make the line probably about four. So it's gone up a little bit higher than what I expected. But keep in mind, you know, for weeks, people have been talking about the Green Bay Packers. Their numbers just don't show that they're nearly as good as what they are. But they continue to find ways to win. Their losses on the season, they lose to Philadelphia 34 to 27. I uh, lose to the Chargers 26 to 11 and the Giants, or excuse me, the uh, 49ers 37 to 8. So they do have bad performances out there. But overall, this is a team who's done much better than what the what you would expect. Uh, the record's been terrific. And this is uh, probably the most important game of the season for both these teams. So the Packers have done it with uh, smoke and mirrors on a lot of times. But to their credit, they've done it. So if we can get this line a little bit higher, you know, even though I think Minnesota is slightly the better team, I'll be buying on the Packers. Ryan Leonard, professional handicapper over at wagertalk.com. What's going on over at the website right now, man? Um, website, um, we're, uh, Wager Talk is the, uh, doing our videos today. Uh, I'm also doing, I don't know if it's been just a couple of weeks since I've been doing this, but I've been putting up daily videos, uh, basically sticking with the NBA for the most part unless I can't find anything in the, in, uh, the NBA. But these these uh, free plays at, uh, at my Twitter account, at B. Leonard Sports, have just been tremendous so far. Uh, the losses we've had have probably been by a half a point and a point, and when we win, we win. So uh, they've been very successful, and I'm very happy about that. And I put those up a little bit later in the day so I can get a little bit more information. So uh, follow us on Twitter at B. Leonard Sports. Get these free plays every day, and uh, we try to do as much free stuff as we can over a wager talk, just like uh, on your site where you got a lot of uh, articles and a lot of videos on there. So, hey, we're trying to make people a winner. And uh, hopefully uh, if they're listening to these your show each and every day, they're becoming one because there's a lot of good information here. Well, I really appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Brian Leonard, again, over at wagertalk.com, at B. Leonard Sports on Twitter. Check out those video free picks that he's been doing over there. Brian, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to you and yours, bud. Couple weeks off here for us with Christmas and New Year's Day, so I guess I'll talk to you here in uh, 2020. Hey, it sounds great. Have a happy New Year and enjoy your Christmas with your beautiful wife. There you go. There's Brian Leonard, professional handicapper, over at WagerTalk.com at B Leonard Sports on Twitter.